The Tom Woods Show, episode 2384. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, believing that the end of the world might be a bad thing that we should try to avoid is not a Russian talking point. But if we are going to avoid World War III, it's important for Americans to understand what's been left out of the CIA's narrative about Russia and Ukraine. Coming to the rescue here is my brand new free ebook, Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About Ukraine. Pick it up at wrongaboutukraine.com. Hey everybody, welcome to the Tom Woods Show, episode 2384. I have with me a guest who needs no introduction for most of you, but I'll give him one anyway. He's, you know, you, you used to introduce me, Scott, as somebody who has written every book that's ever been written. And I feel like you've done probably 58% of all podcast interviews that have ever been done. <laughs> I, mean, cause you have, I mean, you're over how many thousands? I'm at uh, 5,930-something right what? now. Are you going to do something when you get to 6,000? Just keep recording them? Yeah, I don't know. And, I don't you know, because I'm writing a book, so now I'm only doing like two or three a week. Yeah, I used to do no, five or ten, yeah. I hear you. All right, well, Scott, of course, is the author most recently of Enough Already. What's the subtitle? Time to End the War, War on, on Terrorism. Terror. Yeah, okay. So we want to check that out. Scott runs the, um, well, I don't want to say runs because maybe I'm stepping on Sheldon Richmond's toes, but you're with the Libertarian Institute. Yeah, I'm the director. Sheldon just writes. I mean, he's the okay executive editor. But And are you still editorial director at antiwar.com? Yeah, I'm the editorial director there, which... I don't have that much responsibility for antiwar.com, frankly. That's Eric and, and okay. Dave DeCamp and Kyle Anzalone are pulling my right. weight there. Because then, you know, then you do the Scott Horton show and you're writing this book and I don't know how you're managing it all. But anyway, I'm glad you're able to carve out a little time to talk to old Woods here. I have a couple of things I want to ask you about to try to get updates on sure. that are going on in the world. And I haven't done an episode dealing with China and Taiwan mm -hmm. at all. And so I thought, let's take... I mean, obviously, I know you could do a Rogan-style interview with that, but I don't want to. I don't think most of my yeah. listeners. Sure. I just want to ask you some basic questions about it. Sure. And about the situation. Because obviously, it looks like tensions are rising, but the tensions are always rising <laughs> with the U.S. and anybody. So I don't know how, how different that is, but it does seem like something's going on here. Mm -hmm. And so I listened in to a debate on this subject of whether the U.S. should be aiding Taiwan let's say, by sending them various uh, types of military equipment at the Soho Forum, hosted by our friend Gene Epstein. Uh -huh. And what was interesting was that the side arguing that the U.S. should be involved ended up winning the debate. And that's a real accomplishment because that's not an audience that wanted to vote that way. Hmm. So let me lay out at least some of the gist of his argument and, and you tell me what your thoughts are. The debater who won, his argument ran something like this. That if you listen to the Chinese leadership, you will hear language that indicates that they intend to reunify China. And in the context of Taiwan, we all know what that means. And we also know that they would like to bring about naval dominance for China. They want China to be a power that displaces the U.S. And so, given that, he says, there are three reasons we should want to assist Taiwan. Number one, they are a relatively free society, and that's worth defending if we can possibly do it without too much trouble to ourselves. Secondly, there's a strategic concern because Taiwan has nearly 25% of the semiconductor capacity in the world, as well as 92% of the advanced chip manufacturing. And, and you think, if you think that doesn't matter, then you don't know how important semiconductors are, semiconductor chips in cars and a great many other things. He calls it the oil of the 21st century economy. So that's another reason. Then still another reason is our friendship with Japan. And that if you listen to what Japanese officials are saying, they are concerned about a China that's on the move. The Chinese Air Command says that they could reduce Japan's raw imports by using blockades by 15 to 20 percent that Japan's economy could be severely harmed by an activist China. So all these things put together spell out the need for the United States to take some kind of position that short of war, 
that he hopes might ultimately prevent war in the future. Now, when you hear that, how do you respond? Well, there's a lot of different points there, but I mean, let's start with the end. So we ought to do something to prevent it short of war, meaning what? Uh, oh, we'll ship them weapons. I'm pretty sure that was his plan. And that was the question of the debate. Should we sell weapons to Taiwan? It was something like that. Should we, because nobody was saying, should we go to war with China? But should the U.S. play an active role up to and including the supply of military resources in order to prevent this outcome? Yeah. No, we shouldn't do that. And I think just as it's playing out right in front of our eyes right now in Eastern Europe, we're much more likely to provoke the conflict that our government claims they're trying to prevent. In the case of Ukraine, they literally said, we are carefully calibrating the amount of weapons that we're pouring in so that it's the proper amount to deter Russia from invading without provoking them into invading. And then I even have quotes from the CIA officers who were involved in the arms transfers who complained to the press that, you know, we told the bosses, we've calibrated wrong. We're provoking an attack here, but they wouldn't listen. So this is a government program, first and foremost. Once you have someone with a lobbyist invested interest in selling F-16s to Taiwan, now the calibration has nothing to do with seeing the future in some like State Department weenies crystal ball about what's the exact amount of weapons to calibrate. Instead, you have all the, as though they could tell, like some Soviet commissar with a central plan. But then they have all these external incentives coming in, like, massive corporations like Lockheed who want to sell ships to the Navy and want to hype up and fund all the think tanks that publish all the studies that say all this has to be done and that mostly ignore the fact of nuclear weapons and seem to think that we could have a real fun Pacific War like during World War II with Japan and it'll be great. And the thing about it is that people have just got to get acquainted with the geography here. First of all, Just for the sake of argument, let's say everything that he said there for his argument was right. We cannot defend Taiwan. So, you know, it's 7,000 miles from San Diego. It's 90 miles from China. Imagine the Chinese Navy trying to come over here to the Caribbean to keep Cuba out of the hands of the Americans if they were intent on invading and conquering Cuba. It would make no sense whatsoever. They could not prevail in that circumstance. They could try and they could die in a nuclear war with us. But at the end of the day, Cuba would not be in the hands of the Chinese. It's the same thing here. We could have a war and then still lose Taiwan anyway, but in the process, lose half our Navy and hundreds of planes and possibly devolve into nuclear warfare. To go back to, well, there's a bunch of different ones there. First of all, it doesn't matter if they're a relatively democratic country or not, or land, not really country. It was a a right-wing military dictatorship under American support for, what, 50 years after independence or after the end of the Civil War there. It only became a democracy in the late 1980s and into the 1990s. And even then, our Constitution delegates our national government the authority to provide or to guarantee a Republican form of government to every state in the Union. Not every renegade province on Earth It makes no sense whatsoever for them to give any kind of war guarantee. Now, I admit, I mean, as you started it out, nobody's talking about a war, but I mean, yeah, they are. Maybe at the Soho Forum, they weren't. But I think I already argued, you know, as far as the calibration goes, they've given the Taiwanese, if you want to call it enough to deter, let's see how it goes. But they're just as likely to overcorrect there and provoke a war. And if it does come to war, which all the think tanks have, you know, done their studies and their war games as as well as the Navy has about what it would look like. And almost invariably, they leave out even the existence of nuclear weapons because that would reduce the entire argument to already over. We can't have a war with China under any circumstances. It could go directly to H-bombs and then we start losing cities. We can't have that. I mean, imagine China invades Taiwan, so we all agree to kill ourselves if they dare to do that. It makes no sense whatsoever to try to give that war guarantee. It sounds crazy, but, you know, we could have had a nuclear war over West Berlin. I think about it. The Soviets had rolled into West Berlin. 
Like, okay, we all got to take a cyanide capsule. We have to give up our society because the free, hey, the relatively democratic West Germans lost part of their city to the commies. That was the law at the time. That was the policy at the time that or, or certainly it was conceivable that if that had happened, if we'd lost West Berlin, that those dominoes would have started falling down and we'd have gone to nuclear war over it. This is completely crazy. Same thing with the Carter Doctrine in the Middle East. So the Persian Gulf belongs to us. And even though we hate the new Ayatollah, if the Soviet Union invades Iran, we're given a war guarantee to the Ayatollah we hate to keep the Soviets out, which could have led right to nuclear war right there too. And these kinds of policies, you can see how at the National Security Council, they have this big agreement where they all think they're smart and decide on something, but where they're really just painting us all into some crazy corner. And one more thing about this. Wait, and and we get to Japan and whatever follow-ups in a second, but I I wanted to point out the hypocrisy that the Americans who support the right of Kiev to go to any lengths to reabsorb the renegade provinces of Donetsk and Luhansk in the Donbass in eastern Ukraine, and who absolutely refuse the right of the Russians to guarantee the independence of those renegade provinces are the same ones who say that America should intervene to guarantee the independence of the renegade province of Taiwan from China, and that we ought to play the role of Russia in backing the Taiwanese against the Chinese if they ever tried to reabsorb them with force, which just goes to show that the whole thing is the liberal rules-based world order and all that is made up. The Americans break the law, break the rules whenever they want, like in Kosovo, in Iraq War II, in Syria, in Yemen, Somalia. All these things are illegal. They don't have the pretension of any kind of American legal authorization or UN resolution for any of these things, which I'm not a big UN guy, but that is the treaty that we'd have to have a UN Security Council resolution to authorize starting an aggressive war. Let's do whatever they want, whenever they want. So your point is that There are limits to what can be accomplished in the world, and these are not limits imposed by Scott Horton. These are limits imposed by the reality of things. So it's not that you're just stingy about helping people and the neocons are full of love and cooperation. It's that you're living in reality and they're not. Yeah, look, Pat Buchanan said, what, 20 years ago or something, he goes, what if they roll into outer Mongolia? What are we going to do, dude? Are we going to tell the Beijing that they better get the hell out of outer Mongolia or else we're going to do like Iraq War One and force them out, like forcing Saddam out of Kuwait, or we're just going to have to admit to ourselves that, you know what, outer Mongolia is just not our jurisdiction and them and the Chai Khans are going to have to work that out. You know, and like I can see there is a whole left-right dynamic here. You see it within the parties where the Democrats hate and fear the Russians and the Republicans hate and fear the Chinese instead, right? It's like a trade-off. And that's because Putin's sort of a conservative Republican with a Christian identity and a red, white, and blue flag and stuff like that. So why wage war against a guy like that? They're not not the communists or anything. But meanwhile, in China, I mean, from the right-wing point of view, that's also why the liberals hate him and fear him, right? Then for China, they got this big red flag, which to the big dumb bull of the American right means always enemy must fight. But that wasn't the policy of Richard Nixon or Gerald Ford or Ronald Reagan or either of the two Bushes which is, this is probably the thing that they were the best on, was, you know, Nixon went over there and shook hands with Mao Zedong, who, you know, in raw numbers was quantifiably the worst human being who ever lit, who killed more people than any other person ever killed, including Hitler and Stalin and Tamer Lane and whoever you got, dude. And, and Nixon went over there and was like, you know what, let's end the Cold War with you early now. And did that. That was 50 years ago. Now, we're going to go back on that over Taiwan, which Nixon and Kissinger decided, rightly, as Lou Rockwell would say, it's a heck of a note to have to root for the Rockefellers. But they decided, rightly, that, look, we don't care about Taiwan. Why should we? It matters. It's everything to them. And if really, in the scheme of things, it's nothing to us. And people who say that, oh, yeah, but we built up this massive microchip industry there. Well, why did you do that? Whose interest was it? For America to put their crucial microchips in the global instant order of chains of production over there on Taiwan, 90 miles off of China's coast where they're afraid that China could come and take them at any time. It's like they want just to obligate us to have an award. Meanwhile, you could more or less 
pack those factories up and move them to Texas tomorrow. We already have advanced micro devices is right here in Austin. You know, I used to know a guy that fabricated ships right here in town, a good friend of mine. So I don't know if they quit doing that or they just need to, you know, up their game. But there's no reason in the world why there's something magic about that island, why, why all the ships have to be produced there. It's almost all American patents and intellectual capital behind how to manufacture those microchips in the first place. American engineers who figure out how to do it. And then there's actually a really great article in the New York Times magazine from, I'm going to say like a month ago, Tom, like their weekend magazine did this in-depth thing about the Taiwanese microchips and how important they are. And the thing of it is, like you could tell just from right there, what a fool's errand it is that they're trying to keep these chips out of the hands of the Chinese. At the worst, they can just delay it. But more likely, they're just provoking them by waging this kind of economic war against them when they're going to be able to get the chips anyway. Like there's a billion dollars something worth of trade, or I forgot how many billions of dollars worth of trade between Taiwan and mainland China every year as it is anyway. And you know, the Americans say that, and this is Trump's former I think, deputy or maybe a national security advisor, Robert O'Brien, said that, you know, if China does attack Taiwan, the first thing America will do is try to destroy those microchip factories so that China can't have them. We'd rather nobody have them if we can't and this kind of thing. So, and this is the craziest kind of mercantilist sort of policy that we need the American empire in order to secure the existence of microchip factories for our future or whatever, you know, it's just completely nuts, dude. You can make all that stuff right here in Texas or in any other allied state with stable government where people get along and wages are low, if that's what's so important here. Hey, everybody, let's take a minute to thank our sponsor, Persist SEO. If you are getting buried by your competition online, then build your brand, your reputation, and your lead flow with digital marketing by Persist SEO. If you are a small local business trying to compete against large companies in the service industry, then increase your visibility with Persist SEO. Or what if you have low or no leads coming in on a consistent basis? Well, then website search engine and conversion optimization can help move the needle to a more prosperous business model for you. Are you tired of cold calling and networking, meeting places getting shut down? Use your website as a lead generation engine. Or what if you're not showing up for your services in the search engines? will get found with Persist SEO's expert search engine optimization. All you have to do is call 770-580-3736 or visit them at ineedseo.help for a free website audit and consultation. That's 770-580-3736 or ineedseo.help. I want to interrupt our conversation, actually, because I, I don't want to leave this part for the end. To note that, Scott, your work with the Libertarian Institute has been really, really outstanding. The stuff you guys have done, the writing, the books. Do you want to mention my book situation here as long as you're on my show? Yeah, absolutely, man. I'm excited as can be about it, but you go ahead and say it. All right. Well, so I've mentioned a few times, plenty in my newsletter, but I think a couple of times mm -hmm. here on the show, that I have a book coming out called Diary of a Psychosis, and it's written kind of in a day-by-day -day style, you know, a la my newsletter about what was done to us. And because I do it that way, I'm able to recall little details that everybody else has forgotten. But the sum total of those details is a story we have got to tell. And so Scott wrote to me and said, you know, hey, man, why don't you publish your book with the Libertarian Institute? And I said, okay. So the Libertarian Institute is going to be publishing that book. So it's doing good work. I mean, if you think a Woods book on COVID is a good thing, in addition to the sum total of human knowledge, then you are ipso facto a supporter of the Libertarian Institute on whose board I sit. And he's currently doing a, uh, Scott is doing a fundraiser for the Libertarian Institute. I mean, they, they run this thing on a shoestring. And when you look at these corrupt think tanks where the president's riding around in a limousine and, you know, who knows what happened to your money, Scott Horton is extremely frugal and sensible with donations. So I would highly recommend people support them, libertarianinstitute.org. What do you want to say, Scott? And then we'll talk foreign policy, but I do want to make this pitch. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you so much for saying so, but especially for the opportunity to publish your book. I think that really that's great. And we're also very excited that we're publishing Jim Bovard's new book. You might remember in the 90s, 
he had lost rights. Well, now it is last rights, the death of American liberty. Ooh, and it's clever. Oh, I only read the introduction so far, but he's sending it in the chapters and it's just killer. So we've got, look, we just put out Lori's book, which is questioning the COVID company line. I know you had her on the show. Yep. Brilliant genius, wonderful libertarian, Lori Calhoun, who also, like you, was writing about this right all along for the Institute all during that time. And um, so we just put that out and it's doing really great. It's out on Kindle and paperback and everything. And then we got so many in the hopper, man. We got one by, well, if you read enough already, remember I said that the Iraq War II it kind of was about oil a little bit, but not like you think, not Exxon. It was about oil for Israel and the par- the promises that the Iraqi exiles had made to the neoconservatives. Well, there's a guy who was the basically the American oil czar there in Iraq War II, read my book, was like, oh, you're right about that. And now he's written a book for us, fleshing out that story and telling more about the neocon plot to build an oil pipeline from Kirkuk to Haifa. Um, as part of their motivation for Iraq War II. We got William Van Wagenen writing about Syria, and we have Brad Hoff and his co-author, Zach Wingard, also writing another book about Syria. We've got the wonderful Keith Knight, who is our managing editor, is putting out a book called Nine Reasons. Oh, I'm going to mess the title up. I'm sorry, but it's Nine Reasons Why I Left the Left, something very close to that, or How I Left Progressivism, something like uh, like that. Keith is such an up-and-comer that I feel like it's an insult even to call him an up-and-comer. Oh, it's just great. And he, yeah, you're, he's, he's only that in the sense that, yeah, he's going to be around for a long time and you can place your best right now. Like he's really a evangelical libertarian in the very best sort of way. Um, and then, um, uh, man, I'm sorry, I'm ran and I lost track of all the great books, but there's more. We're putting out five, six books. And of course, I'm working on Provoked, how America started the new Cold War with Russia and the catastrophe in Ukraine, which... I'm shooting for the end of the year, maybe early next year, but I promise I'm working on it every day really hard. I don't doubt that. So, and we got all these great podcasters and great writers that we're publishing every day at libertarianinstitute.org. And we got Ted Galen Carpenter was famously fired from Cato for being too good on the conflict in Ukraine. So now he writes for us. Their best guy is now our guy. And so, as you mentioned, we got Sheldon Richmond, we got James Bovard, Lori Calhoun, and Ted Galen Carpenter, these are our all-stars basically headlining. And we got this whole new generation of up-and-coming guys, as we mentioned, Keith Knight, and then there's Kyle Anzalone, Connor Freeman, and Hunter Dorensis, who I think are all 27 for some reason and are just doing great. And so, yeah, we're really excited that Momentum is with us, and this is the future of the libertarian movement. So, And this is our big fundraiser, so especially calling all of you millionaires and billionaires out there who have to donate to nonprofits every year or else the tax man will get you. Uh, libertarianinstitute.org slash donate is your new home address, my friends. Well, very good. I will just say it, and I'll just say one quick thing, and I mean this, Scott, in the most friendly, brotherly way. Uh, not too much. Sorry. As, a, as a, a dig at you, but I've been thinking of at some point doing like a little workshop on writing itself because I have a lot of would-be authors and authors in my... Uh, newsletter audience, and, and I have some tips to give. So I was thinking of putting on something like that. And so I asked my list, tell me, what are the struggles you have as a writer? What are the obstacles you face so that I can see what the most common ones are and I'll try to answer them? And one of the things they said was, I don't know when to stop. I don't know when I have said enough. And so Scott, I am now affectionately referring to this as the Scott Horton problems. Yes, that is fair, and I accept that, but I have good news for you, good sir. Okay, what? Which is that the aforementioned brilliant genius, Lori Calhoun, is also by trade or another or some kind, an editor. Oh, and good. I had her, I said, you know what, I don't even want you to read it. All I want you to do is like zoom all the way out in Word and just scan through it. Just look at the mess I made so far here. I'm at 925 pages right around there, 2,600 footnotes. So she says to me, oh, don't worry. We can get this down under 400 pages. No problem. Because I have this huge problem of, well, two big things about block quotes. One, I love them. And I really 
would rather show you than tell you yeah. as much as possible. Yeah. And she's just saying, no, 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 no. All that's got to go. And then the other thing is about the block quotes is that some of them are there just as placeholders because I just haven't even written that part yet. Right. And I already was planning on summing those up anyway. But they're in a technical sense, these are taking up a lot of space. And she also just insists that every place I go, yeah, but then the New York Times themselves admitted that X, Y, Z. She goes, nah, nah, nah. Just say X, Y, Z and give me the footnote. We're going to save you so much space by cutting out that. So I'm going to keep some of that as much as I feel like is absolutely necessary, but I'm going to cut out as much as I can. So that'll be the contest is how long can I get the book? And then how tightly can I sort of zip file it down back to without losing my claims, but yeah. to a readable size. So this will be an Olympic challenge, but we'll do it. We'll see what I we can do. I'm so glad to hear that. All right. Yeah. Now let's jump into, I mean, again, I, I know we could continue talking about China and Taiwan, yeah. but I just giving people a taste here. The other thing is, I guess oh, you wait, by the way, heard on about. The, one more thing there on, on your thing about books. Yeah. It was Dennis Pratt's idea at Porkfest that I do a little talk about how to write a book because I've written some books. Oh, yeah. So, but I think you guys know I'm not really a writer. I'm a radio host, but I do collect these assertions and I like to claim them and sometimes in writing form. But you know what I mean? I'm not like a natural born writer, like a Bovard or something, you know. But, you know, some people got some things out of it and said that they were going to now embark on that book that they've been thinking about, but weren't quite sure whether they could do it or not. And I convinced them that now they could. So if you need any help with that, I have at least a few things to say that at least somebody it's proven already found a value. Uh, yeah, I'd absolutely love to hear them. I'm, I'm gonna, I want to just do a free workshop like over one of the Zoom or whatever, and, and I'll give a presentation. People can ask. Questions. So, I mean, at some point, if you're on my mailing list, which you can get on at TomWoods.com. You will get invited to this thing as long as you open my emails. You'll see. And I can keep that subject short, by the way, because I don't have that much to say, just a little. Well, you know, it's like, I'll just, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to this in one second. But you remember in 2017, back when Bob Murphy and I hosted the Contra Cruise, which was, we, we hosted a cruise for four years and it was awesome. The best one we did was the one with you and Dave on board and Michael Bolden. That, that was the best one. And we had this informal session where I said, Dave, I want you to do a, private, like off the record, no recording. I'm kicking myself for not recording this thing. Thing on how to, basically like how to write a joke. How does a comedian come up with bits in a routine? And he said, you know, I don't think I have anything to teach on that because I just do it on instinct. I don't think I really have anything to say. He filled up an hour with the most fascinating stuff and he didn't even know, it was all implicit knowledge. He didn't even know he had it. And that was kind of like when I recently did do a writing thing for my school of life people, the knowledge just kept coming out. I didn't even know I had it because it was all implicit up there. Mm -hmm. So I think we both have more than we realize we have. But let's get back on to, let's get to more explicit kinds of knowledge. And sure. I want to talk about what Bill crystal has been up to because he is spending. All right, one more thing about seeing. Taiwan. I'm sorry, Tom, but let me just say about Taiwan real quick. Oh yeah, please. About, yeah, about a week or two ago, I interviewed Lyle Goldstein. And he is formerly at the Naval War College. He's now at Defense Priorities, which is a coke to puss thing, but they're really good guys. I got Daniel Davis over there. And uh, Lyle Goldstein, he did all the war games and studied what war with China over Taiwan would look like for years as a professional there. And I think he's teaching at whatever university now as well. And I interviewed him for about an hour and a half about what war with China would look like. And it is really bad. I mean, he says, we will lose half our Navy. We will lose thousands of sailors, hundreds of planes, and could very well lead to nuclear war. And not just the threat that China would resort to nukes, but the threat that the Americans would resort to nukes. Yeah. They start losing sailors by the thousands and these kinds of things. In fact, I talked with a guy at, I think, at a YAL Fest just last weekend, or weekend before last, who told me he was a submariner over there, and, and he could verify that the Taiwan Straits is shallow, relatively shallow waters, and we cannot dominate them with our subs. They had too many mines, too many boats. We cannot effectively wage a war there. It would be essentially committing half of our, you know, military force to their deaths and then still lose. So I encourage people, they really are interested in this subject and want to hear about it from a guy who really knows what he's talking about. It's just me asking the questions and Lyle doing the answering there. And that's at scotthorton.org. All right. If we remember to send me the specific link, I can put it on the show notes. Great. Will do. Yeah. Tomwoods.com slash 2384. So Bill Crystal is overseeing the spending of a couple of million dollars on ads to try to get recalcitrant Republicans to get on board on the Ukraine thing, because this is a 
an unusual situation for Crystal that he has to persuade Republicans to be more interventionist. I mean, in the old days, this was the last thing he had to worry about. So that's an interesting development. And the other side of that is, I guess you probably know a little something about the relatively new president of the Heritage Foundation, Kevin Roberts. No, I'm afraid not. Okay, well, he's, you know, he's not right about everything, but he's much, much better than we had a right to expect. Here's what he recently said about this campaign by Bill Kristol. Since when is it conservative to spend the taxpayers' money with, and he's not talking about Crystal spending the money, obviously the, he means the money spent on Ukraine, yeah. with no accountability, no strategy, no timeline, and no end game. That's this the boss of Heritage said that? What? The boss of Heritage said that? Heritage, oh, no, no, hang on, wait. Okay. He says, this ad buy is a waste of money because conservative voters know the truth. We've spent too much money on Ukraine at a time when we can ill afford it, but I'm also not surprised considering how well financed the neocon war machine in D.C. has been. How about okay. that? Okay. I yeah. like this guy. Yeah, so you got to you got to talk to Kevin Roberts yeah. one of these days. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I hope he's not, you know, the mirror opposite inverse the horror show on China like so many of them are, but that oh, is absolutely good stuff. I don't know cuz yeah, sometimes then they break your heart on the China thing. Yeah. They get seriously. your hopes up. <laughs> yeah. Then, but on the um, other hand, if you had him on, you could find all those areas of agreement and then sure. maybe you're the guy who changes his mind on China. Hey, it sounds like it's absolutely worth a try. I mean, to have a guy from the boss at Heritage talking like that about the war party is just fantastic. And you yeah. know, Tom, attitude follows behavior. So the more you talk like that, the more you really think that way. You know what I mean? And yeah. really, like, who could ask for a better leader of the war party than Bill Crystal? I mean, there was a time where... Oh, no, Bill Crystal's coming and he has a desk drawer full of think tanks with him. Echo chamber the size of North America to make every lie he claims seem verified and true and repeated. But just those days are over, right? It's like when Jonah Goldberg led the National Review in denouncing Donald Trump. You could already tell then that was in 2015. And you could already tell then that like, did Donald Trump pay you to do that, Jonah Goldberg? You know how much we hate you, dude. We know that when you say Trump is the worst, that's the best thing that he could <laughs> receive. That's the best endorsement he could get. So Bill Crystal says, give up all that money that you had planning on, had planned on spending on, you know, improving your own family slot in the world and help get some poor kids' legs blown off in Ukraine. So, over a longer period of time so they can end up losing even more land to Russia than they already have lost. Yeah, see, when you put it like that, Scott, it's not as attractive sounding. No, not really. Hey, the guy who was wrong about Iraq and Afghanistan, and I don't even know if he bothered lying about Somalia, but Libya and Syria and Yemen and Iran, but especially Iraq War II. I mean, listen, other than Bush, Cheney, and Paul Wolfowitz, this is the man most responsible for getting America into Iraq War II than any other person in the world. And, and so I, I, follow I, him in a battle or not. I want to make sure everybody listening to this remembers that you had a debate with Bill Kristol, or maybe they didn't know in the first place. Most people do. You had this Soho Forum debate with Bill Kristol where you just demolished him. And he obviously was unprepared. He didn't, he thought you were some punk or something like that. And you just murdered him. It was right before my 2000th episode and you arrived the triumphant hero with a with a huge, funny. loud, extended standing ovation for your performance against Bill Crystal. And every time he tweets something stupid, I think one time I actually responded this way in writing, but the other times it's in my head. I, I'll say, boy, that he didn't learn anything from his interaction with Scott Orton. This did not stay with him at all. Well, let me tell you, Tom, I mean, I went into that thinking... Man, I really got to not let Tom down. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if I walk out of here and I didn't just get killed, then I'm okay, you know? And I did a bit better than that. I'll take it. But then what I never could have expected or hoped for or wished for is that virtually every day in the now, what, two and a half years since, two years since, virtually every day. Oh, somebody reminds him of him right? in my name. Yeah. They yeah. trash him in my name. And some of the things I could never repeat on a family show like yours, but some of the nicer ones are things just like, oh, yeah, and how are you typing? Did your father, Scott Horton, give you permission to write or whatever? That's, those <laughs> are some of the nice ones. Some of them are really bad. 
And it's every day. Like for the rest of his life, people bully him with his defeat at my hands. So it's nice to see. And the thing is, he had ample opportunity, like during the Q&A. Not know, that I'm Irving he, Crystal, by the way. I beg your pardon? Not that I'm Irving Crystal, but I am his daddy now in that no, sense. You know. Know, well, no, we know the sense you mean. But, <laughs> you know, you could both answer a question if you wanted to. You had the option. And so sometimes the questions would come and you would just crush the answer. And Gene would say, Bill, do you have a response? And he would just say no. <laughs> and I took that as he doesn't want to go up against Scott. Yeah. because. Normally, he w- if he were on if he were on MSNBC and they said, "Bill Crystal, do you have something to say to that?" The answer would have been, "You betcha!" And blah 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 blah. But when he's sitting there with Scott Horton, it's no. I, we'll go on to the next question. And by the end of the thing, he kept putting his COVID mask on, kind of hiding behind it, taking it off and putting it back on, and everything. It was oh, that great. is awful! Oh, jeez, he even had a COVID mask. <laughs> the worst, you know. So I've had this thing going on on Twitter where um, because this was so meaningful to me at the time, I figure I'd be. Lying if I deprive people of it. It's a hashtag Ramondo 20 years ago. And I'm tweeting out all of Justin's columns oh. from antiwar.com, right? You know, as they're lying us into war in the early part of the war here. And boy, does Bill Crystal and his neocons keep coming up in those articles. Yeah. And Justin was just the best on him. He called them the little Lenin, uh, called them the little Lenin of the neoconservative movement. Forget Trotsky, this guy's Lenin and just will stop at nothing. And there's just so much great analysis there. So if anybody wants to look at those, it's just hashtag Ramondo 20 years ago on Twitter. And I got a ton of articles there for you to look at. So oh, much good stuff. Dio, Justin Ramondo. I remember the, what you call Iraq War II. I remember how horrified I was at that. And his columns, just reading his columns over and over during that time was uh, such a consolation. And, and I have to say that obviously, although there have been interventions since then, it's been nice not, I mean, there's a sick feeling in the pit of your stomach when the first thing you have to check every morning is antiwar.com. I like to read antiwar.com. I like to read it at my leisure. I don't want to have to read it because it's a sheer necessity because of the stupid BS the regime is up to that's so, so destructive like that war was. And every morning I would be over there seeing what was going on. Are there any silver linings? Is there, I mean, anything. So they really learned from that, that like, it's so important that we use drones and Al-Qaeda terrorist militias on the ground to accomplish American ends instead of sending GIs in to get blown up. And so that was the policy in Libya and Syria and Yemen is, you know, just back foreign terrorist shock troops to go in there and do suicide attacks and whatever. And then that way (laughs) we can pretend that the war on terrorism is over because it's a war for terrorism now. And then nobody really gets all choked up if a predator drone, you know, runs out of batteries and falls out of the sky. You know what I mean? So they just keep it going forever. And then look at like the war in in Ukraine right now. They keep saying, and I'm collecting these quotes like matchbox cars for the book, that they just keep saying, man, this war is great. We are killing so many Russians, but it's not costing any American lives at all. In fact, uh, David Ignatius in the Post was saying, we're all doing great from this war. And then he literally, Tom, put in parentheses, except for the Ukrainians. (laughs) (laughs) Like an afterthought. Yeah, dude. And that's the CIA. I mean, of all the guys at the Post, he is officially known as the, the man closest to the CIA there, former CIA employee, David Ignatius. And just, he's speaking for them. That's the way they look at it. It was like, into the meat grinder, young man. Back to the front. So funny when people like that comment, like on Twitter, the responses are all contemptuous. And it just makes me wonder, how come we're not doing better if everybody who's even remotely conscious sees through these people? But that's a topic for another episode. I want to end by urging people to go, let's put our money where our mouths are. Oh, in a free society, we would freely donate to the, okay, well, let's freely donate now, especially when it's a cause that you know generates results. You know, Scott Horton is not driving around in a limousine. I can attest to that. He just puts his nose to the grindstone and works really, really hard for all of us. So let's do something in return for Scott. So libertarianinstitute.org slash donate. I don't get any, I've never, I don't think I've gotten one dollar from the Libertarian Institute, nor do I seek it. It's just, um, I know these people, known Scott forever, and I know they're doing good work. And I know there are people out there who would like to help something and they're not sure exactly what, 
Here's an example of what. So thank you, Scott. Thank you so much, Tom. And thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.